our next speaker is Stephen Sprague. And uh, I'm going to let Stephen introduce himself. Uh, I don't even remember how we met Stephen. Stephen was, uh, I'll let him do the introduction, but he was the uh, chairman for 15 years of Wave Systems. Any of you who have uh, owned a, a flip phone in the early days, Wave was a big part of that. And now he's the CEO of Rivets Corporation. Excellent. Uh, thank you, everybody, for having me. Uh, a little bit of uh, uh, background on, on uh, who I am. I, I previously was CEO of a company called Wave Systems, spent 15 years in the trusted computing space, really helping drive the technology of trusted platform modules, self-encrypting drives, the, the hardware security that's embedded within your PC platforms. And as part of that, there was a lot of interesting work that's gone on into the mobile space and I started Rivets about a year and a half ago really to address the consumer applications of this trusted execution capability. And so we'll talk a little bit through what all those pieces are um, and, and I think we have plenty of time for questions. So I thought I'd start with sort of a fun quote, um, you know, lead follower, get out of the way. Uh, Bitcoin has an opportunity here and we have been following. If you read all the press about Bitcoin, general consensus from the world out there is, ah, we're putting our money in our phone and we're losing it and keys are getting missing. And it's not been, let's say, the best. Um, um, you know, it's been a little bit of a bumpy road going down the path uh, where it's kind of appropriate. We're in that time of year in New York where potholes are highly entertaining, right? Um, don't get those low profile tires on your wheels because they're not really capable in the Northeast. But we've had some really challenging early losses in the space. And, and I think it's tainted a little bit people's perception of what's possible here. And we've also had some interesting regulatory um, aspects as well, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. I think this is really at the core of the problem. And the core of the problem is we spend an enormous amount of time talking about the blockchain and, and the immutable aspects of Bitcoin and all this really interesting back office infrastructure. What's fascinating about that is there's a whole other half of the problem, but Bitcoin technology and blockchain technology don't address it. And so it's actually been a very interesting conversation. When I went a year, a little over a year ago, I went to the Miami Bitcoin conference and somebody called me up and said, you have to go learn about Bitcoin. So I, I booked a flight on a Thursday night to the Miami Bitcoin conference. I knew about this much about Bitcoin. And, and on my way to the Miami conference, I read the Satoshi white paper on the airplane going to the conference, I figured, you know, might as well have at least some background material. And it was fascinating because it's, it provides a complete replacement for one of the greatest challenges we've had in the cybersecurity space, which is a common central list for identity. And, and so, so now, now knowing, um, you know, one Satoshi white paper worth of uh, Bitcoin, I wandered into the cocktail party at the Miami Bitcoin conference, which was great fun. And by the way, for all of us who have spent years in cybersecurity, all you had to do was get off the elevator and, and the infamous gold girls from, um, uh, of, of the Miami conference, I, you have to ask others, um, were there handing us drinks, which was, which was, this was clearly not a normal um, cybersecurity conference. However, all the people in the room wanted to sit and talk about crypto. And, and so it was a fascinating conversation. I came home from, from Miami really with an understanding that, that Bitcoin was missing a big piece. And what it was missing was the ability to protect, certify, um, and use private keys. And so if you look at Bitcoin, it's really two halves. There's the half that happens inside the peer device. We don't talk about that very much. And, and, I and I would like to use the word instructions. I've used it pretty broadly over the course of the last year. But what we're all about is how do we form the highest quality instruction to the miners? Because we don't do transactions in the phone or in your PC. What we do is form an instruction. And an instruction is, is the aggregate of the data that's made up the amount, the account, how do I want to change it? Bitcoin is a very simple transaction on a blockchain. Blockchain. I'm moving some money from one account, really 
I'm altering one ledger entry and moving the data to another or creating a new ledger entry. And anybody who's taken the first year of accounting, right? Great opportunity to understand how we do just basic, simple entry accounting. And if you want to change something, you have to actually make a change. So high assurance instructions are absolutely critical to the proper operation of a blockchain. How do you generate a high assurance instruction? Well, we use a device, but we know devices have a problem. This is, uh, this is, you know, the NSA did a good job of capturing Andrea Merkel's devices. You know, so we're worried about everything from social engineering to bad passwords to malware, keyboard loggers. It's really easy to create a fake instruction. You know, you can't actually hide a secret in the operating system. So today, all transactions done are done with a device because very few people want to get their calculator out. You can, with a piece of paper and a calculator, actually form a Bitcoin instruction. The math isn't that complicated, um, but trust me, the humans will make more mistakes than the malware will affect. Uh, and, and so there are an enormous list of challenges. We can compromise 100% of all the devices doing Bitcoin not complicated it's just a question of when the target gets big enough right now in real in real realistically bitcoin's kind of very small amount of money it's only a few billion dollars and you probably can't steal all of it at the same time you can only steal little bits but they're just some incredible examples of where a man in the browser or in your machine has altered transactions uh, in brazil last summer they have a whole electronic payment scheme for small businesses and on a Friday, all the money went to a foreign account, all the money. Like they were just paying the plumbers and the printer and the guy who did the advertising run this week and, and a piece of malware got inserted into the computers and what the people saw on the screen was, you know, pay the printer $75 for new business cards and what happened was the $75 went to an offshore account and a huge challenge to actually assure that the instructions are correct what do we need to do? We need secure devices. And there are lots of examples of these from things like a Trezor device or Ledger's USB wallet. Um, this is a paper. Um, not the most convenient. What we want is the same thing Apple Pay has. Carry it around in my pocket, push the button, buy something. And so Rivets is all about turning on the hardware security capabilities that are already resin, resident in modern devices to give you the highest assurance formation of an instruction for a financial transaction. Let's talk about what that actually requires. So what really makes up a secure instruction? So the first is protect the keys with hardware. That's actually relatively easy to do. There are three or four different technologies that are out there. They're industry standard. There's a whole other standards body that's out there called the Trusted Computing Group that's been around for a number of years. There are 130 companies that are part of it. And they've been writing specifications forever. And 100% of all the new PCs you buy have their technologies resident in somewhere, some way, shape, or form in your PC. And it's the ability to hide and protect a secret. Now, one of the challenges that trusted platform modules have, which is this technology that's in all your PCs, is they don't support Bitcoin elliptic curve. So while I can protect the, the key, I have to get the key into the operating system in order to form a transaction. So I now have another layer of vulnerability. And, and so isolated execution is also important. What isolated execution means was when I'm actually forming the transaction, taking the actual data elements of this account, this amount to that account, and I'm going to sign it with my private key so that I can send it off to the mining equipment for them to digest and put into the blockchain, you don't want to have the individual transaction or individual elements of that transaction altered. And so isolated execution is a new technology. Um, trusted execution environments have been available in ARM processors now for about six or seven years out of something called ARM Trust Zone. But it used to be that in order to gain access to ARM Trust Zone, you had to do a deal with the manufacturer. And so for many years, um, certain phones have had this capability and a couple of companies have been able to work with the big manufacturers to embed capabilities within the device. As of a couple of years ago, a new joint venture was formed by ARM and the two big SIM chip manufacturers, a company called Trustonic, 
that's enabled us to have access to program the trust execution environment after the fact. And they've now been shipping that in a number of different phones, most notably as Samsung. And anybody who's interested, I can show you a, a, a full Samsung um, trust execution transaction later on if you like, I have the, a phone here. Also, if anybody wants to just go online, you can go to blog.rivets.com and there's a two minute video of watching a transaction all the way through. Um, and so trusted execution is a really important piece of the puzzle because it provides isolation from the primary OS. We assume that a very sophisticated team of hackers has had full access to modify the software on the phone as much as they like, and we're still gonna perform a assured Bitcoin transaction where you can't steal the keys. So assume a completely rooted phone. However, no modifications to the hardware. So this is software tamper proof, hardware tamper resistant. You know, a few hundred thousand dollars in a really good lab, you might be able to extract the key out of a phone, but you'd have to have the physical phone. And, and at Black Hat, a number of years ago, keys were extracted out of a TPM and it, it destroyed something like 50 TPMs in order to get it out. Um, and so general sense is this is a million dollar vault. If you had a million dollars, you probably could steal a key. I wouldn't put more than a few million dollars in Bitcoin on a single phone. So the third piece of the puzzle and probably the most interesting in technology you haven't seen before is trusted user interface. So another standards body called Global Platform, which is made up of the European banking partners, have been writing specifications around TEE, trusted execution, and now TUI, trusted user interface. And what trusted user interface is, is that in your phone, we can interrupt the main processor, isolate the operating system, actually push a pause button on the execution of the operating system. And the trusted execution environment is, it has the capability to draw on the screen. And so we're able to page memory into the video subsystem that cannot be seen by the OS. And so therefore, we can put the transaction details on the screen, says this amount with this account to that account, and the user has to see it with their eyeballs. And in our case, we have a consent button or a pin pad. You push the consent button, the transaction moves forward. It's not possible for the operating system to push the consent button. And that's a really important characteristic. By the way, 100% of us are familiar with this transaction. Anybody ever shop with a credit card? When you go down to the grocery store and you swipe your credit card, do you swipe it through the big computer behind the counter or a little payment terminal out front? Payment terminal. That payment terminal has a display on it and a pin pad. And the purpose is that display is actually gonna display the transaction your card is gonna be charged. What's on the computer at the checkout counter may or may not be the real amount because that computer is subject to lots of different potential attacks with malware. The Verifone payment terminal or an Ingenico payment terminal has what's called PCI compliance. They actually assure the integrity of the device and the, dis and the display. And so when you hear about something called EMV transactions, Europay, MasterCard, and Visa, where I have a smart card, right? We're all starting to get lots of smart cards as the credit card industry replaces our cards. Um, and we plug it into that terminal, the other half of the EMV specification is that the terminal provides the secure display and secure pin entry. By the way, no one has ever done a secure e-commerce transaction. Because even though there's a billion smart cards deployed in Europe, and they're all very happy with their smart cards, they, they beat us over the head over Magstripe for years. It turns out when they shop online in France, they type in a 16 character credit card number, flip it over and type the three character security code on the back end. Really? Well, they have a chip. By the way, in my old job, we participated with PC OEMs and shipped like 250 million smart card slots. Guess what you can't do? Take your European payment card, stuff it in the smart card slot on your European provision laptop because there's no security technology in the machine for a high assurance reader. Trusted user interface now gives us that capability embedded within, for example, a Galaxy Note 4 phone. So trusted user interface is a critical piece of technology in this because now we've taken all the components of an EMV payment terminal, sucked them up and stuffed them inside the phone. The final piece is proof of state. And so out of, the, again, the trusted computing group, 
back to the first standards body, there are a series of specifications around how we attest to the integrity of a device at any point in time. In essence, it's a very simple thing. You take a reference health measurement of the device, which is actually the final signature of a small cryptographic chain of tests within the device. It's like a little teeny blockchain inside the device. And, and that final um, signature, you write out as a reference value. You could put that on the blockchain. Now, every time I do a transaction, I can test the health of the device and compare it against that reference value. That comparison tells me that I have a known device in a known cyber controlled condition, otherwise I, known as I have cybersecurity controls on a peer-to-peer -peer banking device, that probably meets not only the essence, but actually probably exceeds the concepts of New York State Bit License. On a device that's according to how I've set up my device, so it's Stephen's opinion of the health of Stephen's device, as opposed to whatever random exchange I happen to be doing a transaction with. So that random exchange can help me by testing before they let the transaction go forward that my device is in a known good state. Now the most fun I have is every time you tell this to anybody, whether they're sophisticated and in the Bitcoin space or grandma sitting next to you on the next airplane ride I'm on and I spend a lot of time on airplanes, um, everybody asks the same question, what happens when I lose my device? And it's my favorite question because what we're doing is we're engaging 100,000 years of biological evolutionary development that has gotten us to this point of time, which is when you leave your phone and you walk out of the room. Actually, it happens most like when you get on the bus and the door closes. It, it only happens when the door closes. It's not before the door closes. There's that electrical signal that runs up your spine that goes, crap, where's my phone? Right? And it's a sixth sense. This has required 100,000 years of biological evolution, not for phones. I'm sure it started with, oh, I forgot my club. You guys wait here. You guys wait here. I'm going back to the cave to get my club because it hurt like hell last time when I didn't go with my club. So, so I, think there's, I think there's a great aspect of binding physicality of a device to the tokens that are accessed. By the way, when you lose a password, which everybody lost this morning because as part of the email to invite you to the event, we stole all your keys and, and we won't actually use them for another six months, but you don't know that you lost your cyber credentials until they actually, something bad happens, right? Where if you lose your phone, you know almost instantly and depending on how old you are, I'm, I'm old enough, I can like lose my phone for half a day and not panic, my teenage children, life comes to an end, you have to like stop all activity and go either fetch a new phone or remediate the situation by finding the phone before you leave the house. So what's fun in this case is this is about replacing hardware. Well, did you know that we've already replaced almost a billion devices? About a half a billion PCs and another half a billion phones have trusted execution and secure display capabilities within the device. So millions of these devices are really capable of doing a very high assurance Bitcoin transaction today. So we talked about, about trusted execution and what it really is is a very small independent operating system. So if you talk to people in Bitcoin, they'll say what you really need is a Linux box running in the closet, keeping your Bitcoin safe that's disconnected and air gapped from the network. In essence, trusted execution is that. It's just inside your phone. It's a fully isolated operating system. It runs a microkernel OS. Um, most exciting work that's going on in this space is um, the, the Australian government just did a characterization of a microkernel where they did a mathematical proof that it has no malware in it. There, there are no flaws. And actually, they just open sourced that through General Dynamics. They're doing it for drone operating systems. And it's probably the most interesting technology in this space. You build a Bitcoin wallet on an SEIL4 microkernel and it, you will know that open source has been through proper certification that it is actually doing what it says it's doing and you can test it. Um, we're probably a decade away from having that within our phones, but clearly the work is underway to go do that. And ultimately, this only processes code from known developers. There should be no unknown software that's executed within the device. So just sort of a simple representation 
What we've done is Rivets, as a company, has built a little set of tools, cybersecurity tools, for anybody who wants to participate in the Bitcoin space. Um, we now have a set of basic primitives. They're available at our website that allow you to plug in the cybersecurity tools into your own existing wallet. We're not trying to build the only wallet. We're trying to build cybersecurity tools for everybody's wallet. And across a range of applications, we actually have a chat app that's um, just in the process of spinning up over the course of this next week, um, where the private keys and messages will be encrypted within the trusted execution space. It will be the highest assurance messaging app built. And it's been done by a bunch of undergrads at Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, it's an app called Chatter. You can download it on your phone. Their Android version will support rivets in their next imp implementation. And um, we're doing a bunch of work in the storage space, Storage J. We're also working um, with a couple of folks supporting the uh, MadeSafe network. Uh, we've just uh, are announcing a relationship with Factum, also with the Omnicoin uh, Foundation to support Omnicoin in this. So there'll be a range of different platforms that are available that you can leverage uh, as part of this. Clearly, you can also use it for simple authentication. I would tell you that I think authentication isn't enough. That if you look at the Internet of Things, I don't want to log into the doorknob and then insecurely say lock, unlock. What I want to do is send an assured instruction to the doorknob that says unlock or to the medical pump that says change dosage to 25. You don't want to log into the medical pump and then who knows what gets sent to the medical pump. So assured instructions, I think, is a really a new way of thinking at how we communicate. It's basically just messaging. So we're providing a set of tools that leverage the built-in hardware, a simple set of components, both we expose a set of APIs and then allow you to build them into your app for any app. We don't care if you're wanting to build Bitcoin or something else. Everybody can benefit from hiding a secret. Um, whether that secret's used for you know, one end of the spectrum, a very high assurance identity, or the other end of the spectrum, very high assurance anonymity. And anonymity with really strong identity can be much stronger. Uh, let me give an example of that because most people don't um, see that. Imagine if you could, with very high quality, know your customer AML pay, $25 for the Wi-Fi access for all of New York. But what I give you is the March access key. I give the same March access key to 10,000 other people. Because that token can't be copied, I know you're one of the 10,000 people that paid for global access across all of New York for Wi-Fi. I just don't know who you are. And for the first time, you'd actually have truly anonymous it's, it's like a cash and carry phone, right? You paid cash for the phone, they have no idea who you are. That transaction can be properly isolated and not as easily tracked because I can't tell that you're the unique identifier on how you went everywhere and you slept at your house each night. This is actually, you're just one of 10,000 tokens that look exactly the same. And so you can get to a much higher level of anonymity with these technologies. So, this is about creating assured instructions, protection of Bitcoin and blockchain transactions, but really binding a device to a virtual SIM. I use this analogy of a virtual SIM because I think it's important to understand anybody can now build a carrier, right? What makes your phone unique, why your phone works, is you don't have a password. You register your phone with the network. And then it's cool, you can just make phone calls. By the way, I have almost no fraud. It's actually so good, we almost think our phone is secure enough to run a wallet in it. It's not. You need access to the secure element. What, what Apple's done with Apple Pay is gained access to the secure element within the phone, which gives them their own, in essence, virtual SIM. And so for the first time, they have the same qualities and characteristics that AT&T has. AT&T doesn't want to put all your money on their SIM. It's their SIM. So this is an opportunity for everybody to create their own SIM within the phone for encryption, decryption, signing of data, whatever the transaction happens to be. A simple picture I won't spend much time on, but this is what isolated execution looks like within your phone today. A technology called ARM Trust Zone is built into the ARM processor on everybody's handset. Only certain manufacturers expose it so we can leverage it. An interesting collection of partners are coming on board. It's been an interesting process over the last six months to educate the world 
as to what does it mean to have a high assurance instruction. There are a lot of different ways to accomplish this. We're building one of them. We're trying to do it across PCs, phones, and tablets, and providing a very simple capability for anyone to integrate. At the end of the day, you can go and get native access to all the way down to the bottom if you want to, and then you just have to duplicate what my team's done for the last six months, which is spend the better part of a couple man years actually making the parts work, as opposed to a weekend just hooking it up inside your app. So I think Bitcoin is set up to lead. Now I've had some interesting interactions over the course of the last few months. I came out of building enterprise security. I actually just went to a conference a week ago that was um, hosted out in the Bay Area that was really a mixture of enterprise and government security. Had a grand old time. Because for the first time we were showing high assurance transactions with Bitcoin and something they're only talking about still. So if you want to do the highest assurance identity transaction right now, we can do that on a Samsung phone with trusted user interface and Bitcoin. And so we were demonstrating the state of the art in cybersecurity on a modern mobile device running on blockchain technology and Bitcoin to the people who think they're writing the specifications for that next generation of technologies. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're not. I'm at my last slide, so. Uh-huh. So in a peer-to-peer -peer banking system, it's not necessary for the miners to have any awareness that the transaction comes from a high assurance platform or a low assurance platform. What will become important in time, so the way we'll, we believe one of the elegant ways to do this is to do a multi-sig transaction. Half of the transaction is your normal transaction, username, pass, or you know, the authentication that you're familiar with in doing a transaction. The other half will be the health and integrity of the device. So, so how do I test that reference value against a known device? Now I have a complete cybersecurity control. I have a known device in a known state. I can register that state in the blockchain. Let's say with somebody like Factum, it's relatively easy to say, this is the state as of this point in time of this phone. Every transaction subsequently done, I verify that that state hasn't altered. And so now what you've done is so I'll, I'll rattle off a few standards just to give you an example. That will meet the essence of NIST 800-147, how I do root of trust in the phone. NIST 800-155, how you report that health measurement to a network. And FIPS 201-2 derived credentials, which is how I assure a cyber credential held in the device is properly protected for That's secret. The, we're never in a condition, miners don't care. If you send crap to the blockchain, the mining equipment will process the crap, right? So if I steal your private keys and move all of your money to my account, will the mining equipment test that transaction? No, they're just gonna ex execute it, right? They're getting paid to process. They're not getting paid to think. And we don't want mining to think. That would centralize Bitcoin. Now you could centralize Bitcoin by having a centralized exchange that does cybersecurity controls around your transaction. That's called Citibank, right? The way you do cybersecurity controls today is you look at log files, you check IP addresses. I, I just drove up the East Coast to bring a bunch of horses back from Ocala, Florida to Massachusetts. It happens to me every single time. Halfway up the East Coast, I am not on normal travel patterns and they shut off all my credit cards. I mean, not one. I went to a gas station, Dave's truck stop, and I went through all the credit cards in my wallet and paid them cash because they decided, you know, look, I can fly around the world. I do a couple hundred thousand miles a year. They don't care that I'm using my credit card in Barcelona. That's like normal. But stop in South Carolina, Dave's truck stop. That's not a normal route I'm on. And, and they shut everything off, right? Because they're looking at it and saying, Ooh, where where have we seen him before? Has he ever been here before? You know, what's he doing? Oh my God, he's buying gas going up the East Coast. Why is this idiot driving? He's got two hundred thousand air miles. Um, and 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 so the cybersecurity controls have all been performed by the centralized infrastructure of the bank. So the challenge is New York State bit licenses 
correct in asking the question, which is, if we look at any element on today's blockchain, forensically prove to me that the user intended for that transaction to happen. Oops, we're done. So the blockchain is only best efforts. Now, we know that all the transactions that have a three were at least multi-sig. That's a huge improvement compared to single sig, which I have really nothing, right? And do I really know from whence it came so I can go back to that exchange or provider or, or online wallet provider and ask, did you really check anything? So cybersecurity controls on an unknown peer-to-peer -peer banking system, that's an interesting challenge. What we're trying to do is demonstrate that the technologies exist to have actually the highest level of cybersecurity controls, but on a completely, truly peer-to-peer -peer banking infrastructure where I register on a distributed basis my reference values, and then I ask every time I do a transaction, I, I ask that through a multi-sig structure, can that transaction test that my cybersecurity controls are still properly in place? And so then I can assert by looking at the blockchain that this transaction, when executed, was executed from a known device in a known specific condition, and that condition can be looked up, you know, go ask Stephen what his condition is supposed to be because I'm responsible as the owner of the peer-to-peer -peer bank, it's my device, for asserting that it was in a known condition that was acceptable to me, right? Because my known condition might be very different than your known condition as to what you believe is an acceptable environment. So when I walk into an McDonald's and they have a little dirt, the instructions Absolutely. I think that, so, so the question, just to repeat for those who are online, the, the question is, the real value is that we're moving from an unknown device you walked up to and looked at and has a little Verifone written on the outside and, you know, the brand of the retailer and you're just assuming that the guys at Target or at McDonald's are properly managing the PCI compliance of their devices and there's not malware running in all of them, which we learned over the course of the last couple of years was an issue. Right, the actual endpoint Verifone payment terminal. And, and you're moving that into the handset that's in your hand. And, and the reality is you're correct, which is the device I carry, I have a much higher level of assurance that that device is the one I expect it to be, that it hasn't been in somebody else's control. I, I have a very different risk profile. And if I wanna have a very, very low risk profile, I can decide I don't load, download any apps, I don't do any of these other. So, so the consumer gets to choose how much safety equipment they want when they go out and they acquire their device. It's no different than the automotive industry. You can you know, go buy a really inexpensive car with one airbag, or you can buy the more expensive car that comes with 73 airbags. Unclear which one's actually more secure, right? But the nice thing is we have independent labs that crash test them and let us know that this one's got five stars. And even though this one's more expensive, it only has three stars because they put the airbags in the wrong space. And, and I think that's an important characteristic in this. The true protection here, um, you know, you get benefits from open source, you get benefits from standards, you get benefits from specifications, but fundamentally underneath all of that, the fundamental thing we get is identity. And the reason identity is important is when we discover that there's a weakness in a Model 73-5 device, we can let everybody who has one know, or you can go to a website and look it up, and then you can make your own decision that, you know, look, that 73-5 is my kid's phone, it's got 20 bucks on it, what's the big deal, who cares? Or my 73-5 is the device I'm using to manage the funds for my corporation, and I've got $25 million protected by it. Hmm, I might wanna look into what really the weakness is that goes there. Today, we use unknown computing equipment for almost all of our cryptocurrency transactions. Another way to say it is you're running all of cryptocurrency on the North Korean provisioned computing devices, right? And so are you comfortable with that? Are you comfortable with the new laptop that's you got for free at the mall from the Red Star computer company whose business model is every piece of spyware ever developed by the KGB to properly steal everything you own, you know? And, and, but it's a free computer, so you can take that one home. Are you allowed to type your credentials into that? So known computers or a known device is a very important characteristic. And for Bitcoin, this is an easy way to accomplish it. What's fun, truly fun is, I don't know, 
it, it's it's geeky fun, but I've been doing this for a long time, is we just lit up all the parts that everybody's been talking about for 15 years. We've been talking about trusted user interface and global platform specifications. I built the first devices in my old job in 2001. We just turned them on. We're like the first idiots to turn them on. Not only that, when we turn them on, you know what the cool thing about Bitcoin is? 100,000 merchants were compatible with that transaction from the first device. So the one thing, Bitcoin's brave, right? It's lead, follow, or get out of the way. Bitcoin's willing to modify the merchant infrastructure. Apple's not. Apple's still wandering around with a 16-character credit card number that's based on an 88-character punch card format from the late 1980s. It's a punch card format. I visited one of the big processors down in Atlanta in the late 90s, and they were running big old VAX machines processing virtual punch cards at that point. But that's why they were batch processing the cards at the end of the day, because you'd print all the cards, you'd put them in a tray, and you'd run them through the batch. That's what the original credit card processors did. And, and we just haven't modernized enough off of that. Cryptocurrency is the first modernization of global payment. Huge opportunity if we can show how transactions modernize in the process. So happy to help. Any other questions? Sure. Uh, I, so, so, so for the benefits of online, the, the question is from a gentleman who, uh, who, who starts off by saying he's, he, he learned about Bitcoin three days ago, um, but you're already deep into the one of the great debates in Bitcoin, which is, um, so the concept of, of how do we maintain 51% control on the blockchain, what, and, and really in two ways, one from a processing power perspective, if somebody all of a sudden showed up tomorrow with a lot of processing power, it'd be interesting. And the second one is, um, if you can control the network traffic, then you don't necessarily have to control as much of the 51% because you could steer the traffic and therefore with a lower amount of processing power still accomplish a 51% attack on the blockchain. So I would say two things. One, I think we're in an interesting time because with the price decline in Bitcoin, there's actually a lot of equipment that was built and put in place and sitting in racks. Some of it just powered off that exists right now that could be just turned on in a moment's notice. And so we're at a very interesting time in, in the Bitcoin network um, because you have this capacity to just light up the power and in theory could put a significant amount of compute power on and off the, trans, on and off the network at any one point. I think in reality, um, the controls necessary and what would happen if a 51% attack were to happen and how does the community respond to that both in the concentration of compute power has been an interesting dialogue over the course of the last year and we've seen everything from the major um, mining companies agreeing to not take on more than a certain amount of capacity to limit their availability they're already geographically dis dis um, distributed quite broadly so from a network control perspective it would be quite hard to control on a network basis but but ultimately, there is a huge community of people who are focused on how do we reduce the risks associated with a 51% attack. The higher the transaction volume goes, the lower the probability becomes of that kind of attack. So as the network grows in value, you'll see greater and greater distribution of the compute power because there's economic value in running the transaction processing servers. So I think it's an interesting technical conversation. I think it's an interesting conversation for the Bitcoin community, you know, as we all sit around and have a few too many beers at the end of the day. Um, but I would also say I'm not entirely sure that it's a huge problem in reality in the day-to-day -day operation of the blockchain network, that there is a very focused community of people who are paying attention to it. And so it's not happening without awareness. And I think it would be very hard to do a 51% attack today without setting off a lot of alarm bells simultaneously. And it would have to be done by somebody who's in the community. It'd have to be done by somebody who has aggregated enough processing power um, in the current ASIC technology, et cetera, to do that. You can't just like fire up a bunch of GPUs and do a 51% attack. So I won't say it's not an issue. It's a little bit like I, I played in the internet in the mid nineties. And you know, this internet thing is never gonna do video. There's just no way. I mean, this guy, Mike, Mark Cuban, is completely out of his freaking mind if you think we're going to run video of any scale over the internet. 
Because if you get a billion people sharing videos of like stupid pet tricks, the whole thing is going to go away. And, and I think that what we realize is that given enough resource, investment, human capital to solve really hard problems, um, you know, that YouTube thing is actually working pretty well. I mean, we're streaming this conversation on the internet. You couldn't have even, I mean, we conceived of it in the mid-90s, but everybody told us we were out of our flipping minds that we would ever actually achieve this. So I think Bitcoin is in that early stage. I think the analogy of the internet is very correct. Um, we are going to disrupt everybody who has a ledger. Forget currency. Currency is a demo. Every system that has a ledger is going to be disrupted by Bitcoin because it's probably a thousand times cheaper to audit. You could argue more trustworthy. The audit is an interesting thing, right? But just if it's just a thousand times cheaper to manage all GE airplane parts, they're going to put them all on the blockchain because I need a birth certificate for dust to dust for airplane parts. So who built it? When did they built it? Where did it come from? Did it come off an old plane? Where's the part number? All that stuff. Really, really, really hard to do. Trivial to do on the blockchain. Truly trivial to do on the blockchain. Dust to dust part inventory for the airline industry so that we know the thing that we're sitting in flying through the sky isn't running on a bunch of parts that weren't certified. Very easy to do. That will be a huge disruption to many companies today who audit, build infrastructure around, you know, big SQL databases, you know, companies like Oracle and SAP and others, uh, you don't really need as much of their stuff anymore to accomplish the kinds of transactions that affect the whole world, right? Every web page is driven by a collection of facts, but we're really bad at storing facts. Blockchain brings a new technology to the internet, the ability for the internet to store a fact. Not the truth, just a fact. As of this day, we thought the world was flat. Might not be right, but that's what we thought on that day, and that has changed. So changing the, the storage of facts is a very interesting um, aspect of the internet. So hopefully I answered your question. I think the geopolitical, so the question is concern about the geopolitical control. Um, you know, it's interesting because um, lots of Bitcoin events, we talk about currency and the effect of global currency and whatever. I actually think that's the easy one. I think the really hard ones are communications and telecommunications and media distribution. And so there's this little pilot project from this little company called Apple. They have this thing called an iPad. They've been shipping them around all over the world. And they're not a licensed technology in Germany for the delivery of telecommunications and media. Whoops. Oh, so over that internet thing, we can deliver to an iPad thing, the equivalent of a cable company that competes with Deutsche Telekom. It's an unlicensed media and telecommunications company in all of China. Hmm. Really? So the Chinese have let control, oh, they have that big firewall thing, but that doesn't only, it only works a little bit. Um, so really they've allowed a third party US based telecommunications company called Apple to distribute devices. Can they censor the content on the devices? Yes. Can they shut off Germany at will? Sure. If they can find my iPad and shut it off, they can shut off all the ones within the geographic boundaries of Germany. I'm just picking on the Germans for fun. I don't know why. Um, so, so media and telecommunications, Mm, if you had a choice, currency or all of telecommunications and media, and you're the nation state, which would you really like to hold control of? You really want hearts and minds. Um, currency, people will figure out how to, how to do trade. But hearts and minds is important. And this is the, the disintermediation, disintermediation of government supervision of hearts and minds. And I think that will have a bigger impact. I, by the way, blockchain is a facilitator of that. The internet is the big facilitator of that because we can now communicate. But with a little bit of crypto and a little bit of identity, blockchain is a registration authority for a three billion customer cable company. So we'll see. I, I, I think the game's afoot. And, you know, it's a little bit like uh, back in the mid 90s. You know, those computers are going to do multimedia. It's going to be fantastic. We're going to disintermediate Sony. Yeah, but your experience with a computer is you, it's green and it goes beep. 
right? You haven't seen multimedia yet. You know, there's some friend who's running MIDI through his Apple II, but you don't know how to make that work, right? We're, we're in the early stages of, we've watched this video before and we're always surprised every time we see the video that we can think 20 years into the future based on these technologies. Blockchain is a very, very important piece of the puzzle. Bitcoin is a great example case to put blockchain technology into work worldwide and we'll see how it plays out. And we're happy to be here to be part of it and participating in any way we can. So the, so the question is, um, do I have to create a new blockchain if I wanted to host all my data for the GE airplane parts? The answer is probably you, you would like to have some aspect of a side chain or you know, what Factum is doing where it's staked to um, the blockchain from a, from a trust authority perspective but you're actually doing lots of transactions that are then off the primary chain. There, again, are a delightful set of late night conversations as to whether it should be um, you know, its own chain, uh, staked off of the primary Bitcoin chain, side chains, et cetera. Um, and so the nice thing is there's a huge pile of venture capital that's being poured in the top of that funnel and systems will evolve and we've all learned from technology that it may not be the best system that evolves out of it, but we'll end up with one that works and we all use and the one that we get tools for and somehow magically we're all ending up using PowerPoint. There probably were better tools, but we're all using PowerPoint. Any other questions? If not, I will wrap it up and thank you for your time. Oh, there's one more in the back. One more question. So, so the question is, um, explain a little more of the isolation of the trusted execution environment. So there are two different technologies. There's a technology on Intel um, chipsets and there's a technology on ARM chipsets. Intel is actually a separate coprocessor architecture today. It runs in a separate chip. And so you actually have a little operating system in a separate chip and you're, you're sending it commands. Now you're sending them from the operating system. So you could send, you know, I wanna send five to Steven and the malware says send 25 to Fred. Um, and that transaction will get then delivered because the operating system formed up the wrong request and sent it through. Where you catch that is hopefully the user's paying just enough attention so that in a trusted user interface environment, that secure display is actually gonna show the transaction that gets signed. And that secure display is properly isolated from the OS. There's nothing that you could do in theory, unless there's an error in the trust execution environment, there's nothing that you should be able to do in the operating system that would affect what's displayed on that screen. If we were to discover that somehow the operating system could have some piece of malware that would adjust that, then you would know what platforms it happened on. Somebody at Black Hat will show it. And the beauty of multi-billion dollar manufacturers is they'll fix it, right? This is not three kids in a garage who provide the trusted user interface capabilities in these platforms. In the case of ARM, it's actually all within the single ARM architecture of their system on a chip. And so in the ARM processor, there is actually an interrupt that, that does stop the processing of the primary OS and passes control to a secondary OS in ARM trust zone. And, and so again, assuming their microcode in, sil in the silicon is correct, in implementing trust zone and it's been out there for six or seven years without any known breaches of of trust zone that we're aware of that haven't been cured um, that that you have proper isolation so you really have a second computer within the computer and and what makes it a higher assurance process is you tend to do very small things and so the less code you write the better you don't want to build a really rich operating system in that trust execution environment, it introduces the opportunity for error. So if you're doing you know, a few thousands of lines of code, not millions of lines of code, you're in a much higher probability that what's actually executing is what you intend it to be. Humans still make mistakes. There'll always be patches to these systems. Um, what you do know is that there's no anonymous code running. So if, if rivets were to implement a solution that had a mistake, then you'll know that rivets was the failure point we have to go fix it and you're not gonna trust us until we fix it and we can prove that whatever hole was shown has been properly cured. And so you do that through a mixture of both open source certification bodies and then ultimately aftermarket testing.
with that, I think I'll wrap it up. My time is up. Thank you for your time and your attention. <laughs>